you for inviting me. It's nice to be here with you. Mm -hmm. um, I'm primarily a theorist, and um, I think it's indicative of the, the situation that we operate in that one of the, the ways in which I understand theory is a operating from an initial conceptual kind of point of departure, the possibility of positing sets of alternative realities and then finding the strategies to make them come into being. And so um, I think the, the, my friend Anselm Franke says, why is it that every time you open your mouth in public, you declare yourself to be a theorist? <laughs> and I think that is the reason, because I think theory is absolutely fundamental, <coughs> not to the analysis of current conditions, but to the positing um, of a set of alternatives, and then to the kind of plotting out of how they might come into being. Um, now, what, what I'm going to, to sort of, of try and plot out today um, has, has its, its sort of, of um, roots in, in various different trajectories. Uh, one is, and all of them are grounded within our kind of collective and mutual existence within a, neo, a set of neoliberal structures from which there is now no outside, right? So we are in and of and about neoliberalism and there is absolutely no outside of it. It's like, you know, neoliberalism is capitalism. There is no outside of capitalism. And so how do we operate? Um, now, part of this set of interests has to do with um, an interest in education, not as the training of people for this, that, or the other, but as a set of forums for gathering, exchanging, uh, producing kind of, of mutual engagements, and redefining the notion of what is so central to um, the world of NGOs from which I learn daily. You know, the, and NGOs are, for me, an absolute model of how to operate, um, which is how to be a stakeholder. The, the, um, we long ago left behind the model of interdisciplinarity, the model of, of dragging bits of knowledge around the borders of disciplines. And we are in the process of redefining cultural citizenship and what it means to be a stakeholder. And from the work of NGOs, um, from their contingency, ephemerality, lack of desire to self-institute, um, the, the, I learn an enormous amount about these dynamics. So in part, my interest in education has been about the, the possibility of new spaces opening up for a collective activity of study and research in public. So what is very often considered very private activity, study or research, uh, becoming a collective shared public activity which becomes part of our horizon of expectations. So a lot of my work had been, um, sorry, I've got terrible flashing lights in front of my eyes. It kind of, it takes a minute, it'll go away. Um, so part, part of this, this activity has been, um, The, the potential opening up of um, spaces that are designated for other activity um, as spaces for education. And education is short-hand. Um, education 
for in the way that I'm using it is not a curriculum or a syllabus or a set of institutional prerogatives. Education is um, a possibility to make a set of concerns manifest, to <coughs> substantiate them in different bodies of knowledge, to find a discourse, a, a, a collective discourse of, around them. So to take a set of concerns and infuse them with various modes of substance and share them through a whole set of strategies that we associate with education. So, you know, how, how to turn museums um, and uh, working men's clubs and other, other kinds of, of um, other kinds of forums. Okay, so one point of entry is this notion of how do we open up a whole set of spaces for the, the notion of study in common, of research in common. How does that produce another set of manifestations around our concerns? Um, the second is uh, very particular to this moment of neoliberal institutional life, which is that over the past few years, um, I've spent far too much of my time uh, sitting on various European funding councils and committees and this terrible thing we have in Britain called REF, the Research Excellence Framework, which happens every five years and in which we basically assess the research of every single department and person in the country and allocate research funds according to this. So this has been um, a truly dispiriting, thank you so much, a dispiriting experience and one um, which I wanted to use to think about something else. Um, one of the things, um, I've put up what for me at the moment are a series of key terms. So creativity, innovation, <coughs> enterprise, enterprise, and the notion of platform are what have been taken up by neoliberalism as a way of mobilizing every single subjectivity to uh, a kind of entrepreneurial, uh, independent entrepreneurial capacities. Uh, and in order to sort of, of do that, kind of bringing forth standardization and a lack of substance infrastructure. So standardization, which if any of you know the international organization of standards um, is a way of establishing a whole set of internal markings um, that absolutely ignore external conditions. So you create equivalence between entities, <coughs> universities, service providers, whatever. You, produ you produce um, a way of evaluating and judging through a set of internal equivalences that don't take into consideration any external conditions. So it doesn't matter if the service provider is in Dubai or in Paris, the, the internal markers of equivalence are identical. So standardization has produced a kind of completely fictional scenario of what it is to provide education, what it is to provide services, etc., and has allowed neoliberalism to co-opt every form of, of um, provision according to a kind of fictional set of internal markers, while absolutely ignoring the conditions that people are working in. Um, the, the, cultural traditions that people are working in. It becomes completely irrelevant. 
the other thing about the cooptation of creativity, innovation, enterprise, and the notion of platform is that this is a way to operate while not providing any kind of substance infrastructure. So you uh, sort of, of, of create um, a culture of doing things with no investment, basically. Right? So you use your energy, your imagination, your creativity, your connections, your networking, your whatever, without actually requiring a substance infrastructure. This, this is also had, as we all know, a, a kind of knock-on set of effects on education where it um, is, you, you provide people with just the information that they need for operating in the world. You don't necessarily provide them with anything else. So criticality, which we had for thousands of years thought was central to a notion of education, is not only unnecessary for operating in the world, but detrimental to it, right? Not too much reflection is not good for an entrepreneurial kind of, of, of um, initiatives. So, this is a vocabulary which might have stood for something else originally, but is now, through standardization, through a, a kind of uh, mobilization of a whole set of resources that we have, individual resources that we have, um, has in a way taken us out of conditions. So. My interest is how to go back to conditions, but not as context. I am a great Deleuzian. I don't believe in context as the, the, the sort of, of set of things from which we emanate as an explanation for what we do. But uh, I'll come back to, to this in a minute. My, um, my work on all of these committees made me realize something very interesting. And it's, this is the project that I'm in the middle of right now. And that is that um, under neoliberalism, there is no such thing as a forbidden subject. All subject matter is absolutely open because if we are operating in a totally market-driven sort of, of world, you cannot in any way predict what becomes a potential market. And what becomes a potential market, as we know, does so within a minute. And so you cannot outlaw any subject matter, because any subject matter is a potential market. So where do you do your evaluation? How do you do your evaluation? If you can no longer say, that this is a legitimate subject and this is not a legitimate subject. This has a relation to foundational knowledge. This does not have a relation to foundational knowledge. This, um, etc. If you cannot do that through subject, then by, by default, the entire evaluative discussion moves to methodology. So any subject is legitimate, any area can be opened up for study, but methodology is where we police knowledge. So I thought what I need to do now is take these three, four years of dispiriting activity and write a book about methodology and see how we can take up methodology as the arena in which we can do something. And we are, I think, very well positioned to do so in the arts and creative practices because of the kind of huge set of permissions that practices have given us over the past 10 years. So this, this is sort of the arena in which I'm operating. But before that, um, <coughs> I think we need to sort of understand that we are positioned at a, a moment of very significant break in knowledge. The knowledge that we had inhabited over the, the kind of 
large scale and long standing um, project of post structuralism has been grounded in notions of episteme. It has been grounded in notions of episteme in the sense that the questions always revolve around what kind of claims, what kind of assumptions underlie a body of knowledge and allow it to circulate in the world as a truth claim. We have moved from epistem as the foundation for our organization of the perception of knowledge to um, notions of practices. And I'll, I'll sort of try and, and, and talk about practices and permissions and conditions sort of, of, of towards the end. Now, the, the sort of, of notions of practice have with them a sort of, of, of set of permissions that don't build up knowledge in an archaeological way, right? <coughs> so this is not Foucault's archaeology of knowledge. This is not layer upon layer upon layer that allows you to arrive at the contemporary moment of knowledge. The permissions that practices have granted us have allowed us to start in the middle, to start from the moment that we inhabit. They have allowed us to invent archives for problems that we recognize. <coughs> They've allowed us to fictionalize, not in the sense of invention, but in the sense of recognizing a set of limitations and producing a set of fictional voices that can enter those limitations and point to another horizon. So practices <coughs> have entered the field of knowledge production in a way that allows us to move away from epistem, from foundational knowledge, from notions of assumptions and truth claims into a completely different arena. It doesn't mean the practices aren't grounded in what is learned. They are grounded in what is learned, but they organize it in a different way. Now, I think that this moment that I'm talking about, the moment that moves from epistem to practices, and that defines for me this, this current crisis in our understanding of knowledge, is based in a series of um, realizations. One is, and, and these are, I think, for me, the challenges to knowledge. What is our recognition of our incoherent selves, of the fact that it is virtually impossible to align our national selves, our ethnic selves, our sexual selves, our imaginative selves, our political selves, our cultural selves, um, that it is virtually impossible for us to align these with any kind of coherence. Now, Theoretically, we know this. We know that we are multiple. But when we partake of any kind of public activity, such as voting, today are the elections in Britain, <laughs> and I'm a Christian. <laughs> so when we, take, when we partake of public activities, there is, by necessity, a demand that we re-cohere ourselves. We don't get to vote 56 times on each aspect of our identity. We vote once. Mm -hmm. So we re-cohere ourselves. And this is true across the board, in any kind of intersection with public organizations. <coughs> so one of the great crises of knowledge 
is what to do with our incoherent selves when we are in the position of study. Who are we studying as? This part of us, this part of us, this part of us. How do the relations between these parts operate in the moment of study? How do we produce study as a field of dissonance <coughs> between all of these demands that our incoherent selves make on us? And that is why one of the reasons that I propose that you look at Harney and Moulton's The Undercommons, because I think they are great masters of dissonance and uh, is such very interesting to me. So this is one of our crises. Another of our crises is the recognition that we all share that we have to confront capitalism. We have no choice. We have to confront capitalism. It defines through neoliberalism the basic conditions of every aspect of our imaginative, material, <coughs> political, cultural, and spiritual lives. How do we confront capitalism? Not by sitting down and writing a book about capitalism. <laughs> so what the world does not need is two billion books on capitalism. And nevertheless, this has to be part of the daily practice of our lives. So part of the crisis of knowledge is how do we, in some way, produce our life's activity as a mode of confronting capitalism. And we do this in part by understanding the way in which key terms have been occupied for us by capitalism. But we do this also by producing a set of practices which mean living it out in different modalities. Part of the crisis of, of um, knowledge that we are living out is what happens to the spaces of thought within a kind of neoliberal, late capitalist set of realities. So the, there used to be designated spaces of thought. Thought took place in universities, in laboratories, in reading groups, in philosophy bars, in interesting conversations between people. Now, many of the institutions that have sustained <coughs> thought have become um, revenue enterprises. They have to make money. This is what they have become. Um, universities in Britain, in the arts and humanities, um, are no longer subsidized. We have to be self-supporting. We have to be self-supporting through revenue, which is essentially Two, comes from two sources. Student fees, which as you all know go up and up and up. Um, <coughs> and of course student fees are only made possible through the culture of debt in which we exist. And debt is actually a form of credit. Um, in Undercommons there's a wonderful text by Harney and Moten called Study of <coughs> Debt. And they show how debt has become a kind of positive condition, a necessary condition. So we raise revenue through fees and we raise revenue through grants. <coughs> now, in both of those areas, in order to raise revenues from fees and in order to raise revenue from grants, we have to produce our thinking not as speculative, but as bearing impact. In education, bearing impact means direct pathways to employment and professionalization. And in grants, impact means direct path to application. So speculative thought really doesn't have any space any longer. So this is, this is one part of the spaces of thought. The other part is that increasingly in the West, in metropolitan culture, there is no more public space. Space is private. It's privatized through a variety um, of, of uh, 
of strategies, part of which emanate from the fact that people with money want to privatize space as a form of security for themselves, and part of it that cultural institutions are so strapped for money that they use whatever they have, and what they have is space. So to a point where in my university, where I teach, um, if I want to organize a conference, I have to rent the space from the university. <laughs> so when I say spaces for thought uh, have been shrinking um, significantly, it is a, a very serious issue in terms of how do you begin as part of the crisis of knowledge to define new spaces and new practices for thought because they are not there, right? They are increasingly not there. I know that Norway is in a completely different uh, state of conditions, but um, normally what happens in Britain happens everywhere else about six or seven years later. So I think the writing is on the wall. And maybe the fourth crisis of knowledge has to do with spaces of permission. Um, we have, for a very long time, within sort of progressive education, thought that it is through educational practices, progressive educational practices, that we would be granting permissions. And we have understood that um, through a whole set of, of developments, beginning with the Bologna Accord, which, um, is Norway part of the Bologna Accord? Yes. yes. As you know, the Bologna Accord is not compulsory. It is an accord to which countries signed up voluntarily. Um, it was offered as the promise of continental mobility and um, the demand to create uh, equivalence within um, a, a sort of different systems was in order to enable the mobility of students and scholars across numerous systems. It has begun to operate as an absolutely classical model of standardization, um, which again, utterly ignores the conditions in which things are operating and which allows for less and less and less investment of substance infrastructure. Substance infrastructure doesn't mean material infrastructure. It doesn't mean buildings and water and heating. And um, Substance infrastructure <coughs> means how you question what you need to, to know, what kind of, of knowledges you need to have, what kind of tools you need to operate with, not in terms of market demands, but in terms of the kind of expansion of consciousness and the expansion of the horizon of what it is to do. So all of these are part of this crisis that I'm talking about, which is the shift from episteme to practice. So we have been left with a system that emphasizes bureaucratization, homogenization, compatibility and transferability, monitoring and evaluation, and education that is linked to either employment or market application in one way or another. And the question is, what do we have at our disposal to work our way out of this hole that we find ourselves in? Now, 
these for me are the key terms with which to work at this moment. Conditions, permissions, practices, and fugitivity. And uh, I will try and unpack these a little bit. When we recently um, started thinking again about practice-based research, uh, everybody here is familiar with practice-based research, right? It's a very central trope in what we are all sort of working with and thinking about. About 10, 15 years ago, there was a tremendous rush towards practice-based research. Um, it was a rush that I think was partly due to market forces. There were a lot of people who wanted to do this, and universities needed to, to take advantage of that. Um, there were a lot of developments within artistic practices that foregrounded study and research. Um, and there were a lot of interstitial spaces that could be occupied um, through this. So there was a tremendous rush towards public practice-based research. Everybody instituted programs. And um, my year with the REF exercise in Britain made me realize that we don't know what we're talking about, that basically we have not thought out any of the criteria or understanding. We've packaged it, but we, did, we haven't thought about it. So the, one of the things that I've been thinking about is how to differentiate between practice-based research and um, classical research as it's done within the different forums and institutions and programs of research. And I think that for me, because I'm, I'm trying now to develop a whole arsenal of terms and criteria and understanding for what is a big movement uh, that is operating without any intellectual ground, which I think is terribly dangerous. Because when you operate without intellectual ground, the speed with which you become captive to bureaucratization, homogenization, standardization is instant. And that's what's happened with practice-based research. So this is a moment for me to go back and really rethink the ground. One of the things that I think is the ground is the difference between operating from inherited knowledges, so operating from a set of knowledges that have preceded us, have been sort of, <coughs> of established, documented, produced as a set of archives, and made transferable. So moving from inherited knowledges to working from conditions. What does it mean to work from conditions? I've missed out a term. This is why you can't have PowerPoint. <laughs> okay. Criticality for me is a foundational term. Working from conditions is based on the notion of criticality. Criticality is not criticism. Criticality is not critique. Criticality is very much our present state, which is that we are hugely informed by 40 years of post-structuralist critique. We know how to see through and to unveil and to expose and to unravel and to analyze and so on. Nevertheless, we live out the very conditions that we are subjecting to critique. Right? So we are existing in a duality. We can see through what the, the, the conditions of our lives, but we live them out. We're not outside of them. So we have to develop 
a kind of double language, which is as much experiential as it is analytical. And we can't do it separately. It has to be one language. Because the analytical will always be privileged over the experiential. It has more credibility. <coughs> it has more legitimacy. It'll always be. A purely experiential language is very, very hard to theorize, to kind of bring in to, uh, to, to OK, now I'll say it differently. Purely experiential language does not move easily from specificity to generality. And when we're producing culture, we need to be able to move from specificity to generality. So the, the, the sort of, of importance of criticality is the recognition that whatever it is that you're analyzing, you're also living through. And whatever way you express that has to be this double language, this language of analysis and perception and of experience and, and conditions. So this is, for me, what working from conditions as opposed to working from inherited knowledges means. And this is the one of one of the shifts that have taken place within practice-based research. Um, the sense of permissions is something that I think we have um, gleaned from a whole set of practices. Some of them are artistic practices, some of them are activist practices, some of them are NGO practices, political practices. So we are surrounded by groups of people who are practicing. NGOs practice as opposed to solve problems. NGOs practice as opposed to changing governing. NGOs practice instead of drawing conclusions and disseminating those conclusions in the world. NGOs are remarkable knowledge producers, but what they circulate does not circulate as formal knowledge. So one of the, the sort of ways that I have of understanding what it is to practice, what it is to start in the middle, is by looking at NGOs, <coughs> by looking at what they do. Um, if, if you want um, a, a sort of more detailed and profound understanding, Michel Ferrer has edited an amazing book called Non-Governmental Politics. And he's written um, a, a very brilliant introduction to the book. And I think that book, more than anything else in the world, has made me understand um, the contributions of NGOs to a kind of broader culture. The, the possibility of focusing on something very small and very minor, not starting to <coughs> link it to a kind of world organizing system, staying with it, staying with its conditions, staying with the actors in the field, trying to slightly shift conditions without um, entering either the machines of governance or the machines of knowledge production. So NGOs have been very, very central to my understanding of conditions and permissions. Artistic practices that, um, Anders, am I overrunning my time? No, it's OK. Take your time. Yeah. <laughs> I felt that because of, of, of being dizzy, I should cut it by uh, No, don't do okay. it. Take your time, please. Sorry, I, I'm dealing with too much, I think. Um, <laughs> my head is full of too many things, because we are living out such a crisis at universities in Britain that um, we have to rethink every aspect of it. So. Permissions that are coming from the artistic, the world of artistic practices, are extremely interesting because, like NGOs, they have 
they have the, the, the sort of ability to start in the middle. They combine bodies of knowledge taken from anywhere and everywhere. Half the artists I know started as artists, then went to university and did a PhD in geography or political science or philosophy or whatever. Then went to work with some organization. Then went back to the studio and started merging all of these languages and knowledges into practices that um, don't fit easily into something called art. <coughs> They're practices. <coughs> they work with conditions, they work with permissions, they work with different um, modes of representation, they very often intervene rather than represent. So some of the permissions that um, I get come from artists. Political activists in, the, in recent years have been enormously central to the invention of new knowledge platforms. I mean, one of the things that I find incredibly interesting is that over the last decade, there's been an almost seamless movement <coughs> Ideas generated in the privileged conditions of universities where it's possible to focus on certain things have moved um, into the art world where they have acquired completely different representational platforms. So the delivery of ideas in the art world, and the delivery of ideas in universities looks very different. In the art world, you don't stand around and lecture people, right? You do other things. From the art world, because these ideas were now circulating in what looked so differently, although the ideas were really the same, they moved into the world of political protest. So we have had and this is for me really the educational term, we have had this very fascinating situation in which a movement of ideas has united universities, artistic practices, and social and political protest movements. If you think about Occupy, one of the first things that Occupy did anywhere, no matter where, was establish a lecture series, publish a newspaper, and set up a library. Anywhere. If you look at political protest movements across the Middle East and East Asia, how central educational practices have been to those protest movements. How much of the effort has gone into ad hoc seminars, discussion groups, circulation of texts, etc. So we're beginning to understand that this is the counter to the market instrumentalization of education. <coughs> right? So the the sort of, of and it is not through the dis, a, a series of decisions about policy. It's through the people's practices. 18-year-olds gathering in Wall Street or Rothschild Boulevard or St. Paul's Cathedral or Turin Port or the main highway out of Hong Kong know one thing, that they need to learn. That they need to find a way to ask the questions because the language that is there for them to ask the questions doesn't do the work of asking the questions. And so they know that they need to learn. And so we have had a very, very interesting trajectory. And I, I have to say, I'm an optimist. Not quite as naive as Adorno, but <laughs> an optimist. In the sense that I think we have two parallel movements. We have the neoliberalization of knowledge, 
and we have the educational term. And to me, the fact that one is backed by the state <laughs> and the other is not, mm -hmm. doesn't make it any less powerful, any less important, um, any less worth taking account of. So with that, I want to end with the notion of fugitivity. Now, Hardy and Moten, um, they, they're very interesting. They come from two very distinctive, um, <coughs> they come from f two very distinctive traditions. <coughs> Harney um, is a, studies management and logistics. So he studies the business world, the world of finance. <coughs> And Moten comes from a uh, radical black study. So they have two sets <coughs> of very particular instruments that they can use towards this notion of fugitivity. It's one of the things that makes the book so fascinating, is it's not always clear where this is coming from. So this is where it's coming from. Critical management studies, <coughs> critical logistics studies, critical accounting, which are real fields in the world, I found out, and um, radical black study. Now, the undercommons which they <coughs> inhabit is not a realm where we rebel and we create critique. The undercommons is a space and time which is always here. So the <coughs> undercommons is not the establishment of an external rebellious platform. The undercommons are always here, always amongst us. In, in, if you know Deleuze's work on the fold, the, the, <coughs> the space of the undercommons is a space enfolded within our daily activities. <coughs> Fugitivity, which is the work of the undercommons, defies the logics of systematization and instrumentalizing knowledge, and instead wishes it to be <coughs> wishes it to be in the world, to produce the world rather than fit into it. So fugitivity, which the word sounds like something that is running <coughs> away, is actually a mode of inhabitation. A, a lot of the terminology and thinking comes from Deleuze. Um, so if you know you're Deleuze, you're kind of, of somewhat familiar with this. But if fugitivity is not a running outwards, it's a running inwards. It's a running inwards into a set of spaces that are always already there. Fugitive study is study that is enfolded within <coughs> the spaces and protocols. You need some water. Mm -hmm. I have some water. <laughs> Can you, no, no, just here, yeah. give this to Krista. Yeah. <laughs> mm. So fugitive study is study that is enfolded within the spaces and protocols, but does not adhere to them. So it's within them, but not operating according to them. Fugitive study is what we can excavate from the occasion of study, but not necessarily the mode of study. So study is an occasion. It is not a mode. It's not a set of protocols. Um, a friend of mine called Hiva K, who is from Kurdistan, traded identities with some German fellow. And through his borrowed identity, was able to get a place at the Mainz Art Academy. So he made a lot of effort to get into the Mainz Art Academy. Did all kinds of stuff. Once he got into the Mainz Art Academy, he <coughs> never once entered a classroom or a studio. Instead of which, he set himself up to teach. 
he taught the caretaker of the building how to play the guitar. <coughs> he taught somebody else um, how to replace windows. Mm -hmm. He taught the entire student body how to cook Kurdish food by streaming his mother from Suleimania <laughs> in via Skype um, to give cooking lessons, which he translated. He spent four years um, at the academy teaching. A lot happened to him in the process. He was not a service. He found a mode of study which was enfolded within the art academy that had students with questions, with curiosity, with imagination. He found a mode of study which was about taking that up and deploying it in a slightly different way. This is a mode of fugitive study which does not go against the institution and its protocols, but by doing what it does exposes a whole set of lacunae within the institutional protocols. <laughs> Museums and galleries around the world have produced themselves as para-educational spaces. If I have time, let me just read you a series of instances which I find very interesting. In September 2007, No Border Academy was founded in Ceuta on the Moroccan-Spanish border. Over a week, 400 participants <coughs> studied the conditions of migration <coughs> within the EU and the lives of the various borders in the immediate area, thus making the border a set of experiences and knowledges rather than simply a set of lines of divisions between countries and legal orders. In 2009, the Serpentine Gallery, one of London's premier contemporary art spaces, facilitated the establishment of the School of Possible Studies in a nomadic series of spaces around the city in dialogue with developers whose properties were not in use. Now in its sixth year of activity, the school brings together international coalitions of alternative knowledge production in numerous forms, including exhibitions and publications. In November 2012, the commercial gallery, Carol Fletcher, situated in the heart of London's West End, launched a reading group on the subject of organizing for the anti-capitalist transition. <laughs> this is a commercial gallery. <laughs> Open to all comers, the reading group featured a text by the acclaimed Marxist academic David Harvey and was facilitated by a professor of architecture from Westminster University and the editor of the respected journal Radical Philosophy. In September 2012, the noted international arts and theater festival, Steierische Herbst, in the city of Graz, Austria, turned itself into a study camp around the topic of truth is concrete, funding numerous performers and scholars, artists, activists, and delegations of students from 12 institutions of higher education across Europe to discuss possibilities of insisting on truthfulness in public culture. November 21, 2013, the group New Cross Commoners entered a decommissioned library in South London and began a performative reading action. According to a curriculum they had set themselves, returning the library to its original dedication, reading. This is just a set of instances that I have written out, right? There are thousands of others from which we can, we can take. This is fugitive study. This is the, the possibility of entering, of positing slightly alternative realities, of using up the occasion of study <coughs> in order to produce a highly critical, <coughs> highly critical realm of possibilities. And it is the, the sort of ability 
of fugitivity to embody conditions, permissions, and practices, which I think makes it such a potentially powerful term for the arena that we wish to put forward. Thank you for your attention. I'm sorry if I went on too long. Okay, then we are starting off again. I hope you enjoyed your uh, lunch, the fish soup. Um, yeah, and Eric is sitting here waiting for uh, your questions. So uh, we have some minutes for that. I don't know if you want to ask a question to start with, or no? Just just to say that. Um Just to say that it doesn't have to be questions. Um, that um, if you have sort of general comments or whatever, uh, just please feel free. I, this is all stuff that I'm in the middle of. So it's, it's coming from many different directions of what I do. And I'm trying to bring it together into a series of coherent arguments. It's not there yet. So I'm absolutely in the middle of all this. And any discussion is helpful because it shows you where the argument is not well structured and isn't working. So please, please feel free to. Yeah. I was just wondering, you were talking about experimental, pure experimental language. No. Is it? Yeah. <laughs> experiential. Experiential. Not experimental. Experiential. Because, okay. because we have, because we have, this is in the context of criticality. Yeah. Because my understanding of criticality is this duality yeah. of being able to analyze yeah. and sort of give it a sense of what conditions you're working from. And for that, we need an experiential language. Well, sure, and most experiential language is very delegitimized uh, because it's sentimental or it's overly personal or whatever. And so it becomes crucial to develop another uh, experiential language. That's what I was talking about. Thank you. Uh, I have uh, two questions. One is, uh, when you talked about the uh, fugitive studies, uh, would you say uh, it's the same as uh, the idea of acting subversive, going into structures and making use of them from the inside? Is there a parallel to how you think and talk about fugitive structure mm -hmm. uh, studies? I, I think that sort of of sub to be subversive requires a plan. Um, and I think that questions of resistance, or questions of, of, of subversiveness, are, I, I think they tend to connect in a very direct way to a general critique. Whereas I think what fugitive study opens up is a possibility of inhabiting a space in a completely different way that you invent for yourself, but not in confrontation. Right? So it's not about a confrontation with an institution or an ideology, but it's a possibility of kind of finding forms for desire that allow you, you know, to operate in a space in a different modality. And um, the, the sort of, I mean, the other thing about you know subversiveness and resistance, they're very easy to spot, right? We all have students, you know, who, who, who although I, I have to say, students always surprise me. We just had an occupation two weeks ago in at Goldsmiths against the fees and all the stuff that's going on, and they occupied the main administration building, and um, they asked me to come and talk. And it could have been any classroom, you know? They wanted to know this and they wanted to know that and there was a, it was a seminar. And, um, and I thought, this is very interesting. You have occupied the administration building. 
you've put up all these slogans, and then what we do together is what we do in the classroom. <laughs> exactly the same. So uh, there's something really interesting about the fact that students' desire is to study. And, and sometimes they feel that everything is getting in the way of studying. So they create a, a highly dramatic situation in which they can really study. So it's that, you know, the, the, it's the ability to evade the too easy frameworks of opposition, subversion, resistance, and so on. So I think, I think fugitive study is more slippery. It's less recognizable. The, the, you can't quite put your finger on it, and therefore you can't discipline it so much. Okay, but then I think it's very much, uh, I mean, just as always, a question of language and definition as well, because I think that what attracted me always to uh, uh, the terminology of subversivity is then rather how you describe the uh, fugitive studies, that I always tended uh, to prefer the more subtle form of uh, mm -hmm. uh, the subversive acting mm -hmm. uh, inside of existing systems. Yeah. And um, then to the next question, when uh, I uh, talk about these uh, existing systems, uh, can you say a little bit more about uh, when we talk about infrastructures? I mean, should we, we think of infrastructure, it's roads, it's, uh, it's more in this kind of physical infrastructure mm -hmm. uh, we think of first. Uh, you mentioned already that uh, uh, a tendency to open this idea of infrastructure <coughs> more up. I think today we think very much infrastructure in the form of technologies, data transfer and communication. Mm -hmm. um, but where I, on the other hand, think it's very nice to think of infrastructure of the very simple thing as well. Where I, for example, think of when we talk about communities, the role of the uh, uh, kitchen table, that uh, the kitchen is a very nice social space in a flat, mm -hmm. and where actually the most important dialogues evolve rather in, around the kitchen table than mm -hmm. in the sofa in the living room. Mm -hmm. So this kind of uh, things. Uh okay. I'll, I'll try. Um, I should say um, I, I uh, am part of a collective called Free Thought. And uh, we are co-curating the next Bergen Assembly. And our entire project is on infrastructure. And um, the, the, so one of the things we're trying to do with this project is we're trying to move the notion of what enables. Because infrastructure, classically, is what enables something to happen. So it's everything that goes into the sort of support and um, movement um, that enables something to happen. So material infrastructures, digital infrastructures, um, there's, there's a kind of whole set of understandings. But infrastructure is also a kind of crazy modernist term, which is largely in the hands of planners um, who sort of, of use it in a completely unexamined way as something progressive, right? So infra having infrastructure is by definition for planners a progressive thing. Um, and so one of the things we're trying to do with our project is we're trying to think about maybe there are other definitions of enablement. Maybe enablement is not purely infrastructural. Right, so maybe building a whole set of material and other conditions that enable something to happen cannot define enablement. And I, I think for me one of the reasons I'm interested is I think infrastructure is operating for us like biopower. I think infrastructure is a form of biopower, i.e. we have internalized it and we use it in order to govern ourselves. So it becomes an internalized mode of self-governing. And uh, we have convinced ourselves that we cannot do anything without infrastructure. That you cannot travel without a grant and you can't do an exhibition without a you know, budget and um, you can't set up a classroom. We've convinced ourselves entirely that um, 
the, the sort of the kind of enablement that material infrastructures <coughs> offer us are the only conditions for something to take place. And that's something that I think I want to get out of. And I, I don't want to think enablement like that. And um, I think we also all know the price of infrastructure, the, the sort of, of the absolute sort of, of wreckage of things that it leaves behind, because one flow of mobility is privileged over all other mobilities. I mean, uh, for example, Schengen, the Schengen Visa Accord. The, in order to have, for Europeans, to have easier mobility within Europe, the, what has happened <coughs> is incredible restrictions on movement within the African continent. So people can, can move far less easily within Africa because there's pressure from European government, from the EU, to keep them away from the borders, to keep them away from the coast, because from the coast they can figure out ways to travel to Europe. So people in Africa are experiencing <coughs> extraordinary difficulty in moving around because people in Europe want to move around more freely and have created a whole bureaucratic infrastructure for that. So infrastructure always costs. And <coughs> because it's a modernist term, and in modernist terminology, progress never costs. It only you know, kind of takes us forward. So one of, one of the things I want to think about is the cost of infrastructure. Does subjectivity have an infrastructure? So Raymond Williams very famously talked about structures of feeling. I want to think about infrastructures of feeling, feeling and affect. So that's, that's another set of questions. But maybe the most important is to think about what else in the world enables besides budgets and grants and spaces with air conditioning and auditoria and um, everything that that we believe is infrastructural. The group that I told you about, um, the New Cross Commoners, um, it's, it's a group of former students at Goldsmiths, but they, um, they reanimate infrastructures that have been evacuated. So they go to all kinds of places that used to be a library, used <coughs> to be a school, used to be a theater, whatever, and they do what it was supposed to do and is no longer doing. So they, they kind of, of, they bring content into a, a disavowed infrastructure, which I think is a very interesting kind of, of, of model. So, you know, I have a, a wonderful colleague at Goldsmiths, Elvira Djangiani Ose, who comes from Equatorial Guinea and works as a curator in, in across Africa. She's actually curating the next Gothenburg Biennial, if any of you are from Gothenburg. <coughs> But she writes about how artists in Africa, in the complete absence of, pu of organized public space, produce public space through their practices. So they're producing an enabling infrastructure without an infrastructure. And these are the kinds of things that I think the discussion of infrastructure really needs. Um, you know, to be hijacked away from the planners, to have a completely different definition of enablement uh, attached to it. So that's, that's the kind of thing that I'm thinking about, my colleagues are thinking about. I invite you all to Bergen on, in September 2016 to come and see what we've come up with. And um, after the day after the opening, we're going to have the infrastructure summit. So we will have people from all over the world putting forward models of infrastructure as they understand it. Thank you so much for Thank the invitation you. to Bergen and your elaboration on these uh, questions. Thank you for asking uh, them as well. And uh, of course, we will have more time to, to talk uh, during breaks and uh, discussions that we will organize later. But now, uh, okay. André, thank you. Thank you.